Well, this is awkward. This video was originally going to be a retrospective of Ubisoft's 2014 driving MMO, The Crew, discussing both how the game has held up in the decades since its release and the massive influence it's had on the entire racing genre. However, given that the very thing that made The Crew so influential over modern racing games has ironically killed it months before its 10-year anniversary, I can't really do that anymore. How does The Crew hold up 10 years later? It doesn't because Ubisoft literally erased it from existence. On that note, be sure to check out StopKillingGames.com to see what is being done to reverse this and how you can help to ensure that this kind of scenario never happens again. In the meantime, let's discuss another decade-old driving game. One whose physics are fantastic, whose visual fidelity still stuns, and whose influence upon the medium is still felt to this day, Forza Horizon 2. That's the last fake-out, I promise. In all seriousness, the second entry in the Horizon series represents a major leap forward for the franchise and, by extension, the racing genre as a whole. Growing past the adolescent jank of its ancestor, Horizon 2 sheds the Codemasters menus, Need for Speed characters, and both the technical and literal barriers of its predecessor to create both a seamless multiplayer experience and a genuinely liberating open world. In tandem, the mechanics and aesthetics of Horizon 2 established the modern identity for the series, laying the foundation by which the franchise would dominate the racing landscape. With that in mind, let's leave our limits and take a look at Forza Horizon 2 10 years later. Alright, wow. so here we are, presumably along the Amalfi Coast. And this is Forza Horizon 2. Joining me today is friend of the channel, Mr. A. Hey, everyone. This is the part where we do the obligatory, Oh my god, I can't believe this game is 10 years old, look at it! That seems like a running theme with games nowadays. It's like, can you believe that this game is as old as it is? And this is certainly one of those games that would make sense to do it, because it looks gorgeous. Yeah, it does, absolutely. Did they, did they have any kind of, like, variety to the singular environment they have here? You know, four or five brought in weather, season Oh, stuff. We'll, we'll get to that. Well, this is actually, what's really cool about this one is that this is the first Horizon game, and the first Forza, actually, to add wet weather conditions. It's the very first Horizon and Forza game to have wet weather, to have rain. Yeah. Which is badass. Horizon does tend to be a bit of a test bed for all the stuff that later gets implemented in uh, the mainline motorsport games, because the following Forza Motorsport game, Motorsport 6, it had rain. Kind of like what, uh, I think what you were saying about how Grand Theft Auto might be testing some stuff. Yeah, in 5. You know, for GTA 6 in 5, yeah. That's a good. That's a good place to do it, um, where you've got users uh, before you go live. Just test it where everybody's at currently, and, and see what works, and implement it better when it gets to the newest IP. Wow. You look at these cutscenes, like right here. This is in-engine quality. Like it looks gorgeous. Like people push ray tracing, whatever today. This looks fantastic without it. God, they really get you hyped for this, though, don't they? It definitely feels like a celebration of cars. Oh yeah. Okay, so this is kind of cool, though. So, in contrast to its predecessor, the first Horizon game, where you're stuck with this old 90s Volkswagen Corrado, I think it is, uh, you get an option of cars. So we got three different vehicles to pick from, and you pick for me. Do you want me to do the uh, the modern BMW, the old Camaro? We're going with the Supra, some JDM action. I kind of want to see the BMW, actually. See how that right. rides. This is a beautiful-looking car, you know? Oh, yeah. It's very nice looking. I still haven't gotten used to the newer BMW's grills. Oh, how they're huge. Yeah. Like, just giant, like, just these giant maws. You know, I feel like I've seen uh, bits and pieces of a playthrough of this in the past, but I never really saw it from the beginning. And I played 3 and 4, I think also in 5, and it's, it's, it's kind of similar, you know, outsets for all three of them. Oh, oh yeah, like very similar, and really like this game is the one that really solidified and sort of really streamlined what it was that the Horizon series was going to be. Like the earlier game, the first Horizon. They're aping a lot of other different types of, you know, open world racing games. They're still trying to find the identity for
for it. So what you end up seeing is like very Need for Speed style, like big egos and emos, like, you know, characters in it. That's done away with in this. When was the original Forza Horizon released? Uh, 2012, so two years before this one. Do you think they took any signals from the Dirt series? I felt like Dirt got a little bit more... Um... Oh, absolutely. Like, the UI is very, like, Codemasters and just Dirt in the prior game. And I feel like this is a little bit more appealing. If you go back further to, like, Gran Turismo games for PlayStation 2 and even like the Midnight Club series, the other games from that previous generation before the 360, they just felt kind of flat in terms of their style. And then you see in the Dirt series where they're trying to make an evolution of the UI and it changes up things. It makes it feel fresh. This definitely feels fresh, even though it's 10 years. You know? Yeah. It's got a clean look to it. It's definitely got that Windows sort of aesthetic to it now. Like, the prior game was very sort of like Dirt and other Codemaster games, where it's just, you know, it's, it feels gritty, almost. And this one's just very clean, you know. It's very Forza now. Yeah, this still feels modern to me. So how responsive do the cars feel on this? They feel pretty good. Uh, the thing that's really good about this and, you know, similar sort of Simcade games is, like, the physics have a foundation in something that's designed to ostensibly be a simulator. You know, because the main physics are derived from the Forza Motorsport physics. So what they do is they take that, they soften it up a bit to make it more playable. And it's re this really nice balance of more simulatory handling, but in a package that's very sort of, you know, that's still pretty arcade-y. Yeah, you know, the foundation is sim, the ultimate execution is arcade. There's just a great abundance of different companies making car games, and, and there's it's, it's competitive. Oh, yeah. I feel like Forza has been able to keep people's attention. I'm looking forward to what six is, well, at least where six is going to be set, and what the changes they're going to make. Yeah, people keep gunning for Japan, and I do not blame them in any way, shape, or form. Like it would, that would be a very fun environment for racing. Yeah, I mean, and they have you know the. Everybody will go back to, like, Tokyo Drift, but they've also had, like, Initial D and a couple other properties um, hit on that, that drifting aspect uh, of the Japanese scene. All right, so one thing I wanted to make sure to mention is that uh, one of the big improvements this game made, just a big step up from the prior Horizon game, it is the first Horizon game that's actually, like, a truly open open world. So in the prior game, it is, you know, ostensibly and technically an open world in the sense you have a big map to drive around. But ultimately, like, if you want to go off the beaten path, you can't really do that. You're limited to the roadways and everything's guardrailed off. But here, if you want to just drive through various fields and, you know, farmland, you can. Like, it doesn't just open up the environment in a way the prior game didn't. There's a visceral feeling of driving through crops and farmland, you know, just smashing through fences, which is really cool. And your car being okay, you're not being penalized for it, you know. And, and well, yeah, and that's games. where the arcade aspect comes in. Yeah, of course. They, they give you bonuses for doing it. It makes it fun to, to do it. I remember just doing kind of like donuts and stuff, trying to get like long drift chains just to get my, my score up. Do you think they'd ever remaster these games? It's not unprecedented. Need for Speed, they remastered a 2010 release. I mean, that could open up them a little bit with their development times if they had maybe a junior team working on the remasters. Oh, and, absolutely. And then the senior team trying to bring out the best features and test things in those remasters so that they could expand upon it for the new version in the IP. No, I, I totally agree. And I mean, I personally, I just would like to see it personally. Yeah, I mean, just with, with the abundance of features that they've added, I, you know, I would love to see what where they could take this. And there's nothing wrong with it as it is, but it, it would be nice to see what they could do with current gen tech. Yeah, it would be. Well, especially considering that even though I'm playing this through backwards compatibility on the Xbox Series X, this is running at 1080p and 30 frames a second. They never patched this for higher resolutions of frame rates. They didn't put in better textures, so, I mean, given that, it would be very nice to see this, how this could look. Right. You know? People sometimes remark about, for example, Metal Gear Solid 4 being trapped on the PlayStation 3, Bloodborne, for example, being trapped on the PlayStation 4. You can technically play that on the PlayStation 5, however, it's still the same as if you were running it on the PlayStation 4. So, to actually have faithful remasters that 
get it up to the highest level possible the current year and make it future proof in a way. I think it's something that the community could want. So do you feel, you were talking earlier about the water effects on the road. Do you feel that now? Oh yeah, you feel that. Like that's the thing. It's not just an aesthetic change of roadways glistening with water. They actually do affect the physics. It does feel more slippery. And I do think that this was very much a test bed for, you know, in Motorsport 6 where they took it to the nth degree because they added puddles and hydroplaning. This I think was sort of a beta test for that. Yeah, they really did a good job with the lighting though. My goodness. I'm going to go into first person mode just to like, look at this. You see the reflection off of the windshield of the steering wheel and the driver's hands? Yeah, Who needs landscape. ray tracing? Oof. That's what I mean. It's like, it's just rewarding to do this even if there is no actual, like, tangible in-game reward. This is just fun to do. Like, sitting here and looking at it, it feels like what you want. Even people talk about GTA being one of the greatest games, and when you're sitting in first-person mode in GTA, it kind of sucks. This feels amazing despite both of them being released in the same general time frame. Yeah, well, I mean, GTA started off as a 360 game. Whoa! Which doesn't help. Whereas this has the freedom, thanks to the fact that even though it's cross-gen, it's a separate development team. So that freed up the main development house to, oh my god, I can't see a thing, to actually sort of go buck wild with it, as it were. And also, another fun fact, this is the first Horizon game to include dirt accumulation on bodywork, so you can get your car dirty. And it, I mean, it just adds to the immersion that you, you are driving and it's making an impact. I, I remember there were vehicle companies that were saying, if you're going to feature our car, you cannot allow it to have any damage. Well, I mean, if you were to talk to a lot of hardline Forza fans they would talk about how the damage used to be a lot better. Would that impact the driving, or was it purely... Like, you, I mean, you could adjust it, but there was absolutely a simulation damage, you know, depending on what you wanted to do. Let's see, if I go to the menu here, this is a thing that's had a much bigger presence starting in this game and has only gotten more malignant as time goes on, the wheel spin. Yeah. You know, that thing where it gives you the randomized reward. Like, here, it's benign enough. But you know, in the later games, it's like, we give you three things at once and we'll automatically send them to you. We will force million dollar Ferraris and McLarens down your throat. I wonder why that was. If they're always just giving you cars and you don't feel like you're earning it, it kind of ruins my sense of achievement in the game. I, I guess I'm a little old in this sense that I would like to earn the vehicles in the games that I'm playing. Um, I mean, a lot of people agree. I mean, it's it, it became more about car collecting and trying different vehicles rather than building a sense of a career. And I guess that's, you know, it, it lends to the arcadey aspect of it, but it also kind of detracts me from wanting to engage deeper into it because if you get like 15 of those, whether it's getting it in a roulette or paying for it with real money, why would you invest more time into each of those vehicles, you know? Absolutely, yeah. Oh, this is actually another thing they added. Let's do this. So, you know, in addition to adding wet weather and, you know, a truly open world, one really cool challenge type that they added was the bucketless challenge. The idea being that it's a set of once-in-a-lifetime automotive opportunities, the sort of things you'd want to do, like make a list, oh, I have to do this before I, you know, kick the bucket. Yeah, I like these grills. <laughs> the, the BMW's older grills. Oh yeah, they're nice and little. I can tell you right now, this thing is very scary. Like, this really uh, accentuates just how good the camera in this game is. Ah! Uh, like, this is almost scary at this point. Like, it does genuinely feel visceral and difficult to control. I mean, as you're hitting these top speeds, it's just a testament to their graphical design that it can keep up for the most part, you know, and load in oh, these yeah. textures for a new terrain that you're going into. Well, I mean, it makes sense it runs only at 30 with that in mind, doesn't it? Right. I wonder if they could run it at 120 if they did remaster it. This could definitely do 60. I have no doubt in my mind that it could do 60. So, this is obviously the Xbox One version. Yes. Did the 360 version do as well, or...? Well, the thing, the 360 version, they outsourced to a smaller, sort of scrappy studio, uh, Sumo Digital. Right. Which, how do I put this diplomatically? Basically what happened is they were given the raw materials from the first Horizon game and told, remake Horizon 2 on the 360 with 
the Horizon 1 engine and assets. Gotcha. That's kind of what it was. So it is a night and day difference between the two of them. Again, third-party studio trying to make it a roughly equivalent game with limited time with an engine they're not necessarily super familiar with. They did the best they could with what they were given. So, unlike prior Horizon games, like the ones where they had the Need for Speed villains that you had to race against, this one, the AI is using machine learning to functionally replicate actual players. So, if you notice, you know, cars are smashing into me and driving very inconsiderately and dangerously around me, that's why. So is it going off the individual user? Like, for example, they talk about drive avatars, but essentially as you are driving, are they making a model of how you drive? And then if someone sees you, it's actually like the machine learning implementation of you? They are, yes. There's this great video by this channel, AI in Games, that talks about the drive avatar AI. It's a really good video that goes into depth about exactly how it works. It made me think a little bit of the map. I remember in these games that they have kind of like the fill in the map like, it, as you go through a road, it'll be like, oh, you've driven here. I think on the right-hand side, you got, like, a little bit of red, where you've driven that road a little bit, but not down the, the entire road. I wonder if they're taking any of that and saying, like, oh, this is how your car drove on that specific road. And if you've driven it multiple times, maybe they're building up a model of that drive over multiple sessions. But if you've only driven it once, that's they're probably going to run that with the drive guitar. Next well, the AI in games video actually goes into that, how they'll categorize various corners in certain ways to effectively sort of guesstimate how you would drive around that specific type of corner. Oh, based on the angle of the corner, this is you Yeah, how based you on the angle, it. the speed at which you'd go, like there's a bunch of different factors they take into account to approximate exactly how you would go around it. Just an amazing testament to game design. Despite that though, I mean, you'll still have people complaining about, oh god, this is horrible. Which, honestly, I kind of understand because, like, as amazing as it is, it's like, look at who you're replicating. It's a lot of people who aren't going to drive like professional drivers, and you see that reflected in Horizon games to this day. I've had instances in Horizon 5, the most recent release, where even to this day, the AI knows to try to sideswipe you before a checkpoint. That's how in-depth the AI can replicate real people, which is impressive, but also infuriating, because that does that's just not fair. It makes me consider also how much data does that consume, you know, if, if they've mapped out all these ways that you drive on various roads, etc., on different turns. Well, they, they talk about how it's not as data-intensive as you would think, because it's like it's all numerical values for various conditions that they consider. Like, how likely are you to do this specific you know, action under these circumstances. It's not as much space as you'd think it would be. I guess ultimately in the game, you're kind of like an object moving along a line, and how you yeah. handled that line, they could make a generalization of that. Yeah, they can functionally make a formula for it. On the Xbox Series X where you're playing it now, right, is it able to take advantage of any of that extra horsepower? I mean, it's technically capable of it, but there's no software implemented to help with that. <sighs> that it's a shame. Like, the thing that sucks about Forza is, for whatever reason, Microsoft doesn't seem to want to support these games any longer than they need to. This game was shut down four years after it launched, like you couldn't buy it anymore, and then, you know, on top of that, it's like they're not providing anything after that in terms of support or anything. Which is a shame. That's one thing I like about PC games, is that oftentimes you can just scale it to your latest hardware. And for example, with your, your resolutions, it's not locked to the resolution that it launched at. Well, you'll be happy to know that they're trying to emulate this game on PC, this version. And there's been a surprising amount of progress recently. But in any case, uh, now we're going to do one of the trademark event types in this game, the showcase event. This is where you race against airplanes? Planes, or, you know, boats, or any manner of unorthodox transportation. Herd of elephants. Well, I don't know if they go to Africa, maybe. Can I hit him? <laughs> oh my god! Wow, he's got he's legs made, of he, steel. Yeah, wow. The thing that's simultaneously fun and kind of takes the wind out of your sails about these, though, is that at least up until this game, like, you're basically guaranteed to win. Like, it's very choreographed in terms of where the Jets are going to be relative to this Ferrari 360 Stradale. 
does it, it? I feel like they do rubber banding. They have to be. Yeah, they do a lot of that. Well, that's the thing. It's like the convenient thing about it is when the jets fly over and fly away from you. It's like they're out of view, so they could be anywhere. Where are they? They're wherever they need to be in order to ensure that they get a photo finish. Right there, that was cool. Where you saw. Yeah. Do you feel the vibration on that? Oh yeah, it's it's very intense. The audio design, like, this is one of the things that's sort of fallen by the wayside in subsequent releases. You know, just the sound of the engines revving in this game is pretty spectacular. Horizon 3 was still pretty good, but Horizon 4, it really just got bad starting there. Photo finish! This is also the game where they started handing you stuff a little bit. Like, besides the wheel spins, it's like, we now own this Ferrari 360. So this is the beginning of that. Don't get me wrong, it still has a pretty satisfying progression arc where you have to put in some effort for stuff, but there's foreshadowing of what is to come. Uh, speaking of foreshadowing, uh, not that we're really going to see it, but this was also the first Horizon game to really emphasize the multiplayer component, where it just had a very seamless uh, multiplayer mode, where you just go to a menu, click, hey, I want to jump into a multiplayer free room session. It's loading in the background while you're still driving the around the world, and then it just spawns you exactly where you were in single player. Yeah, just have a have like a gradient of people coming in. You know, and then you have some organic elements, like there's car meets in this game where you'd go to spontaneously do challenges. It's really awesome to see, like it's a nice moment where the multiplayer possibilities of Horizon get opened up, but it's also before some of the imposition that would come with it got in. Like it's a nice sweet spot between what Forza was and what it turned into. Thanks for having me today. Oh yeah, it's nice having you. Alright guys, so this was Forza Horizon 2, the 10 year anniversary. Uh, if you liked the video, make sure to drop a like, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell uh, to see more videos like this one from the classiest cavern on the World Wide Web. See you next time. Bye bye